On this Wednesday night, the big smoke. You can smell it, you can feel it. Air quality deteriorates for millions in Canada and the US. How long will it last? Plus, concerns for both physical and mental health. Russia blamed for a ruthless attack. Missiles strike a crowded restaurant in Ukraine. The victims and the mounting pressure on NATO to admit Ukraine. The dubious way the Kremlin is accused of tracking down dissidents abroad. This is Memphis. Global News investigates. And it's the $70 million question. The world's biggest scavenger hunt is going on right now. Will a lotto winner step forward before time runs out? Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Eric Sorensen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Two of nature's great forces, wildfires and wind, are plunging millions of Canadians and Americans into hazardous air quality once more. The fires are burning in northern Ontario and Quebec. And with winds blowing from the north, Americans in Chicago and across the Midwest and the huge population in southern Ontario are affected. As of this morning, Windsor and southwestern Ontario were blanketed in smoky air. 10 plus in Windsor, very high risk, moderate in Toronto, just one in Ottawa on the Ontario Air Quality Index. By late afternoon, the numbers had climbed in Hamilton and Toronto to high risk. And by this evening, many cities across southern Ontario are expected to be very high risk. That thick smoke making it very hard to see the skyline of Canada's biggest city today, but by no means was Toronto alone. Visibility was all but gone in major cities across the Midwestern U.S., with more than 80 million people placed under some kind of air quality warning across several states. Jackson Prosco has tonight's top story. This is an unwanted sight and smell, even in a city nicknamed the Big Smoke. As soon as I stepped out of the door, you can smell it. I'm not experiencing any difficulty, but I could see how people would. A thick blanket of wildfire smoke descended over the most populated part of the country, choking out the sun and raising serious concerns for anyone spending time outdoors. People are wanting to get out, but un unfortunately, this is deterring a lot of people from enjoying their time outside. The plume extends deep into the U.S. Cities like Chicago got an unhealthy dose of bad air, while New York braced for another hazy onslaught. It is unsafe to be outdoors, use a mask, and pay attention to the alerts. For this to happen once in a season would be remarkable. That it keeps happening is worrisome, and the summer fire season is only just beginning. The likelihood of forest fires becoming a bigger concern in coming decades is something that is consistent with uh, climate change. There are physical health concerns from inhaling fine particulate matter. Researchers are also increasingly probing the psychological impact of repeated weather events like fires that can feel apocalyptic. We see links between uh, just breathing these particles and uh, more likely uh, depression symptoms in people. But then there's just the this feeling of, um, of sort of dread. We know that there's a whole um, sort of growing concern about climate anxiety. The worry is things will only get worse as once rare events become the norm, obscuring the sunny days of summer in the clouds of a changing climate. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. So, how long is it going to last and how bad will it get? Let's bring in Global News meteorologist Anthony Farnell for more. Anthony, what can we expect heading into this Canada Day long weekend? Eric, that's an excellent question. So many Canadians wanting to get outdoors this weekend. And if it's anything like today with that horrible air quality in southern Ontario, it just wouldn't be possible. There is some good news. The wind flow is changing. Today, a northerly breeze coming from Quebec right through southern Ontario. And you can see that smoke here on our satellite imagery. Smoke versus clouds further to the east. It's all because of this low pressure system, the flow around it counterclockwise. And what it's doing, it's funneling that smoke in such high concentrations that it's affecting air quality. At the same time, northern Quebec didn't get a lot of rain and these are new fires and new smoke that's going to enter the weather pattern. So there comes a time where it doesn't really matter which direction the wind is flowing over the next couple of days. 
smoke is going to be a factor, but it does start to dissipate over time. And that is some good news heading into the long weekend. Out west, the heat is building 30 degree highs across northern Alberta into the Northwest Territories, and that is going to increase the fire risk in that part of the country as well. Eric. Global News meteorologist Anthony Farnell, thank you. What's the action? What's the action? What do we need? Those record-breaking wildfires and air quality warnings prompted demonstrations across the country today. Protesters gathered in front of MPs' offices on a national day of action. They're calling on Ottawa to stop supporting the fossil fuel industry and enact transition to renewable energy. More than 30 events were held across the country. The U.S. Coast Guard says debris and presumed human remains from the Titan submersible have now been recovered from the ocean floor 10 days after the vessel was first reported missing. The parts included what appeared to be the hull, tail and nose cone. They were unloaded from the Canadian ship Horizon Arctic at the Coast Guard Pier in St. John's, Newfoundland. The Titan imploded in the North Atlantic during a dive to the Titanic wreckage. All five people on board were killed, including the, T the CEO of the company that built the submersible. The Transportation Safety Board and the U.S. Coast Guard have both launched investigations. The federal government has launched a new process to help fast-track applications for permanent residency and improve efforts to recruit qualified health care workers who are in high demand. We know that over the course of the fast, past few years, our health care sector has been hit extremely hard. We also know that it is not just a labor shortage today that we need to be concerned with. It's a scale shortage for the next generation. Starting today, the government is sending 500 express entry invitations to candidates looking to apply for permanent residency. They include doctors, nurses, dentists and pharmacists. The next round opens July 5th for experts in science, technology, engineering and math. Three children are among the victims of a deadly Russian missile strike on a crowded restaurant in eastern Ukraine. The attack killed 11 people yesterday, including 14-year-old twin girls. The Kremlin insists it does not target civilians, but its relentless assault has Ukraine ramping up its pressure to join NATO as soon as possible. Redmond Shannon reports, and a warning, some of the images are disturbing. An eight-month-old baby among the injured in a Russian missile attack that hit a Kramatorsk pizza restaurant about 20 kilometers inside the Ukrainian side of the front line. Nod, nod your head if you can hear us. More than 50 people were injured. Among the dead, Anna and Yulia Aksenchenko, twins who would have turned 15 in September. <laughs> Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky said it's another example of Russian terror. The Kremlin said its airstrike hit a temporary Ukrainian army command post. Russian military not attacking uh, civilian infrastructure. In Kyiv, Zelensky welcomed two of his closest allies. Poland's Andrzej Duda and Lithuania's Gitana Noseda both want Ukraine admitted to NATO as soon as possible, a view shared by many NATO countries bordering Russia. We need to send a strong message of hope uh, to the Ukrainian soldiers in the trenches that uh, with NATO membership on the horizon, they are fighting their last war with Russia. NATO chief Jens Stoltenberg a little more measured ahead of next month's NATO summit. I think it's too early uh, to um, pre-announce uh, uh, the outcome of the Vilnius summit. In Russia, the Moscow Times reports that Sergei Surovkin, a former commander of Russia's invasion, has been arrested. Earlier, the New York Times said U.S. intelligence believed he knew in advance about Yevgeny Prigozhin's attempted mutiny. There is tension, perhaps a split within the Russian military establishment with some commanders who have been close to Rogozhin. That rebellion cracked the foundations of Vladimir Putin's authority, something he'll aim to repair before it might collapse. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London.
Despite Russia's war on Ukraine, it appears the Kremlin is still able to use Interpol, the international police agency. For the past century, countries have turned to that organization to share information about suspected criminals. But Russia's political opponents say it's abusing the system, using Interpol to find and arrest dissidents abroad, including those who speak out against the war. Global News spoke to one man living in constant fear of being hunted down. Jeff Semple has this exclusive report. He's been called Russia's Bob Dylan. Boris Grabinshikov and his band Aquarium have been rocking crowds like this one in Toronto for five decades. Making his American television debut, please welcome Boris Grabinshikov. That's him with David Letterman in 1989, just months before the Berlin Wall came down. Do the Russians know you're here? Uh-uh. <laughs> but Grabinshikov's powerful voice has now been silenced in his own country. One day after Russia invaded Ukraine, Grabinshikov called the war Russia's madness and shame. In an interview with Global News, he doubled down. The evil sort of Z patriots crying, kill the Ukrainians, and this is madness. Grabinshikov is now facing criminal charges in Russia and up to 15 years in prison. He has no plans to return anytime soon. But even outside Russia, the Kremlin's political opponents say they're not safe. I'm in a constant state of fear, says Russian political activist Artur Zaripov. A couple of years ago, Zaripov's anti-Kremlin protests landed him in prison. <laughs> arrested in dramatic fashion, accused of terrorism. After 18 months, Zaripov was released on house arrest and managed to escape the country. He's now living in Poland, but even there, he's been detained and eventually released four times. I found out that I was on Interpol's wanted list, he says. European countries know Putin is a liar. I don't understand why they're still cooperating with Russia through Interpol. Interpol is the world's largest international police organization with 195 member states. But Russia is single-handedly responsible for a whopping 38% of all public Interpol red notices. And critics say the Kremlin is abusing the system to hunt down its political opponents. Following the invasion of Ukraine, Canada, the US and others called for Interpol to suspend Russia. In a statement, the agency says its constitution calls on the organization to maintain police cooperation and ensure communication channels remain open, nor is there any provision in the constitution for the suspension or exclusion of a member country. Russia should have been suspended from Interpol long before the invasion of Ukraine. Prominent Kremlin critic Bill Browder says Russia has tried to add him to Interpol's wanted list eight times. He was arrested in Spain in 2018, sparking a global outcry. And it was only because I tweeted out when I was being arrested that a whole international firestorm was created. But for a lot of people, that wouldn't happen. Russia's political opponents say every time they cross a border, they risk arrest or worse. But Grabinshikov won't be silenced. That's the way I feel, you know. I can't conceal that. If you keep silent, it's still corrosive from inside. Jeff Semple, Global News, Toronto. Tempers flare in Paris. Coming up, what's behind these violent protests against police? Plus, torched, the mountain of illegal drugs that went up in flames. In Paris, fiery protests erupted overnight after a teenager was shot fatally by police during a traffic stop. Dozens of cars were burned, 31 people arrested, and 25 officers were injured. Witness video shows two police officers beside the car before it pulls away and an officer fires into the vehicle. The 17-year-old victim died from at least one gunshot wound to the chest. One officer has been detained on homicide charges. The French government is calling for calm and has tightened security around Paris and other cities. Authorities in Myanmar have torched nearly half a billion dollars worth of illegal drugs to mark International Anti-Drug Trafficking Day. 
piles of heroin, cannabis, meth, MDMA, and opium were burned in a ceremony on Monday, all of it seized from different parts of the country. Authorities have long struggled to crack down on the country's illegal drug trade. A recent increase in production is believed to be connected to political and economic unrest since a military coup took place two years ago. Reptile revelation. Ahead, the Canadian connection between a venomous lizard and a popular diabetes drug. Imagine this little guy beside you on a hot day. This is Rocky, and he has just secured the Guinness World Record for the longest tongue on a living dog. Rocky lives in Illinois with his owner, and she contacted Guinness when she realized her boxer could be a contender. Rocky had to go under anesthesia to get measured. His tongue came in at just under five and a half inches, almost 14 centimeters. Size matters. Another long-tongued species is connected to a scientific breakthrough making waves in the medical world, a Gila monster. A venomous lizard in the southern U.S. is laying the groundwork for some promising medications, and there's a Canadian connection. Global's Catherine Ward explains. By now, it's likely you've heard of Ozempic. Ozempic's being used by the rich and famous. The diabetes medication which has been making headlines for weight loss. But perhaps a lesser known fact is that Ozempic has ties to Canada. And well, if you can believe it, a lizard. Yep, that lizard, a Gila monster, which is a venomous reptile native to the southern U.S. I did basic science. I really had no idea where this would lead. In the 1980s, Canadian researcher Dr. Daniel Drucker discovered a hormone in the human gut. And it was a very powerful stimulator of insulin secretion. And very importantly, it only stimulated insulin secretion when the glucose was elevated. He and many other scientists were trying to figure out how to turn it into a diabetes drug. The problem was that manufactured samples dissolved too quickly. But Drucker had heard about a lizard down south whose venom had a similar hormone with more staying power. In the 1990s, there, were, there was no gene banks. You couldn't look stuff up online. You actually had to clone stuff. And in order to do that, we had to get lizard... DNA. The Royal Ontario Museum gave that job to Bob Murphy. We arranged for the purchase of the lizard and its shipment as airline cargo to Toronto. Pearson, I picked it up. It paid off. Decades later, the medical community is taking the discovery to new heights. Not only is this technology being used to make Ozempic, treatments for Alzheimer's, addiction and heart disease are also in the works. Uh, the reality is that this is a, a very uh, strong network of scientists communicating and working together. Proving that breakthroughs can happen just about anywhere. It's having a huge clinical impact globally, which is just great to see as a physician. Catherine Ward, Global News, Toronto. Madonna is having some serious health issues and has postponed her world tour. The 64-year-old singer developed a serious bacterial infection which led to several days in the ICU, according to her manager. He says she's expected to make a full recovery, but all her commitments have been postponed. Madonna was set to kick off her celebration tour in Vancouver next month. $70 million lotto mystery. Next, searching for the winner before the ticket expires. A monumental moment tonight for a Canadian hockey phenom, Connor Bedard, all but assured of being the first overall pick in this year's NHL draft. The North Vancouver teen is considered a generational prospect with the potential to become one of Canada's all-time hockey greats. The lucky team with the rights to select Bedard, the Chicago Blackhawks, winners of the NHL draft lottery. And speaking of lottery winners, there's one missing. Today is the final day for the owner of a $70 million winning ticket in Ontario to come forward. It was sold last year in Scarborough, but who bought it is still a mystery. And time is running out. If no one comes forward, it will be the largest unclaimed prize in Canadian lottery history. Mike Drolet reports on the search to find the winner and what could happen to all that money. Every lotto winner gets the big check. The confetti they save for the jackpots. But over the past year, the Ontario Lottery and Gaming Corporation has been waiting and waiting and waiting 
to blast that confetti into the air. Because somewhere, someone has a $70 million ticket that expires tonight. I hope somebody claims this prize by 1030 tonight because I just feel sick for whoever has had oh, or has got this uh, ticket. The OLG has put the word out. Search your drawers, wallets, jackets, anywhere you may have left a stray ticket bought at one of Scarborough's 400 retailers. Right now, I think there's the, uh, the world's biggest scavenger hunt is going on right now. Uh, with people that buy the Lotto Max ticket in Ontario. There's plenty of dreaming going on. The OLG has received 1,100 calls from people claiming they lost the winning ticket. Hey Jeff, dreaming of the 70 million? Share it with Mike. Nah. Hey Eric, you look for your lottery ticket? You realize how impossibly long the odds are of winning. Come on. Hey Alan, what's the lottery dream? Have you ever considered that we are living the dream? And yes, it's a long shot, an extreme one, but there is precedent. Holy mackerel. <laughs> this is weird. In 2012, Kathy Jones bought toothpaste and a lotto ticket and then promptly lost her ticket. The OLG tracked her down a year later through her banking information and awarded her the $50 million prize. I feel almost as though I, I've been struck by lightning twice. Will lightning strike a third time? Tick tock, tick tock. Mike Trelay, Global News, Toronto. And that's Global National for this Wednesday. I'm Eric Sorensen. Muslims around the world, including here in Canada, are celebrating the start of Eid al-Hadha, one of the largest Islamic holidays, known as the Feast of Sacrifice. It marks the end of the annual pilgrimage to the holy city of Mecca and as a time for the Muslim community to pray, enjoy feasts, and share gifts among loved ones. Jeff Semple will be here tomorrow. Thanks for watching. Good night.